Today uh, we're talking again about the continue about the concepts of the law of karma and uh, about uh, responsibility in our daily lives. So last times we already talked about it a bit, so I shall review that. Can you hear me over there? Okay, so you must have a good quality of sound. Mm. Yeah. Good. Gil, are you there? Hello, Gil. I'm way in the back. <laughs> <laughs> he blends with the books on he. That's how you can't see him. <laughs> Today, I actually, I, I met the... Uh, we went to uh, uh, an invitation meal and uh, that was provided at a house in for a person in Amsterdam and uh, they are just uh, have just uh, started the business there Thai food is very successful these days in in, in Holland and uh, we also had a, a discussion with the Burmese abbot and uh, he was very happy because uh, he has finally managed to get uh, two monks to come with visas, correct visas, to live in Holland. And now they are studying, they, they celebrated today, they celebrated that fact today with the uh, community. And uh, they will be building their temple soon. They're looking for a place now. So it's very uh, nice to follow up on that and to, to learn about that. And I think that uh, they will be uh, doing, uh, yeah, they will be, they will be uh, uh, finding that place soon enough. Yeah. It's very interesting how many communities of uh, well-practicing Buddhists that also emphasize meditation uh, are there, there are in, in Holland, actually. There are many groups. Okay, let's now go back to the topic. Topic at hand today is... Uh, Right view, and as I mentioned before to you, right view is uh, right in the sense that it, these are views that help us to become more awakened. These are views that we can consider and study. We should not feel at fault for not believing anything, but we simply should give it a chance. We should give it the benefit of the doubt. We should learn to study it and see if it's true. These are the four first principles known as the four, first four forms of right view, which are known as the principles to lead one's life happily. First one is there is giving. There is giving in this world, and it's a good thing to do. There is sacrifice. We sometimes need to help those who are in need. We need to help those who have difficult times, who are in suffering. Some th and there is offering means that we are we that it's good to give credit where credit is due. There is offering means that it's good to give credit where credit is due, or in more traditional terms, to give honor where honor is due. So there is offering is a general uh, principle that it's good to honor those who are worthy of honor, and uh, everyone has is respectful to some extent but some people are more respectable than others. Uh, but everyone deserves some uh, decency, of course. But then there is also the acknowledgement of people having certain good qualities that we can respect and we can encourage. So the sense of the right view of there is offering means also that we want to encourage others who are also on the path of doing good especially if they are taking initiative. Now we've come to the fourth. Uh, actually, I'm now reviewing uh, many months ago already. Uh, the fourth item was there are fruits and results of good and bad actions, and that is actually the law of karma. And the law of karma has, uh, is basically saying that when you do something good, you attract happiness. When you do something bad, you attract suffering. Very simplistic. Good can also be rephrased as, uh, as wholesome, which means you are acting from a good intention that is not motivated by greed, hatred, or delusion, but that is rather motivated by good qualities like generosity or kindness, wisdom. 
and uh, but uh, bad or unwholesome are qualities that are greed, hatred, and delusion, and that will create suffering, attract suffering in our lives. So sometimes the Buddha uses the word good and bad, very simple, but sometimes he will also use the word wholesome and unwholesome, which has a very spe this very specific meaning in Buddhism of being motivated by negative emotions or positive states of mind, being motivated by, conf by, by delusion or by wisdom. So uh, sometimes the Buddha will also use the word the well-directed mind or the ill-directed mind. This is used in Dhammapada in the Buddhist book of sayings or proverbs. Okay, now let's, we moved a lot through this. We talked about what, how sometimes some fear can be useful in life, but some fear is not. Fearing for the consequences of your actions when they are not responsible. That is a useful fear, but when you fear because you are afraid of something that is not really useful, that is not based on realism, then that is not useful. Courage to do good is also a very important aspect of right view. When you are believe in what you do, that you do good, that it always must have good results, then you have faith in goodness. That's why faith is also very important and goes hand in hand with right view. A karma will always ripen for the doer, not for anyone else. You, when you do something, it will always ripen for you. It will, you will attract the result of that karma. That is the first principle. The second principle is a karma that has been done will ripen as soon as it obtains an opportunity. So that means that karma is not always instant, despite the now kind of fashionable statement of instant karma, right? or as they say in Holland, God immediately punishes you. <laughs> yeah, never mind. So karma that has been done will ripen as soon as it obtains an opportunity means that the results of what we have done morally, uh, how we have acted wholesome from a wholesome intention or an unwholesome intention will maybe come back to us later. Uh, but not instantly. So when we are angry with somebody or we say something abusive to somebody, we might feel like, well, that was easy. We kind of got away with that. But then it still comes back to you later. And you find that a lot of people suddenly start to speak abusively to you. Please note that in Buddhism also, karma will always multiply in its results. So you will find that the same, that if you've done something positive, for example, you've praised somebody and encouraged somebody to do good, that may come back to you many times. And the other way around, of course. If you are gossiping, then... <laughs> karma must always ripen sooner or later. It cannot be fled from. You cannot just cancel out the karma, ask for God or ask for the Buddha. Please help me cancel out this karma. But you can dilute the karma, the bad karma, by doing good karma, which makes it like it has more competition. Other karma will come in instead, will ripen instead of the bad karma. And this is similar, just a moment, B. This is similar to you are plotting many good uh, vegetables or fruits. And then the... The bad, um, the bad crops will suddenly, there will be no space for them left. So when you have a lot of goodness in your life, then the bad things you've once done in your life will have less uh, opportunity to affect your life. But that still doesn't justify it. And we should also be reminded that if we are doing something that we will re later regret, even if that karma doesn't ripen instantly because we have done other goodness, we will still regret it. And that regret will in itself be a problem in our lives. Or uh, 
we should also be reminded that when we do something that we will later regret, then we might not have the encouragement to do the goodness to compensate for that. So it's better to not think of uh, whatever we do wrong that you can always compensate or something like that. Like some sometimes uh, some people believe as long as we do something else that is good then we can compensate or something like that as sometimes has been done in some forms of Christianity but not in every form, fortunately. Yes, B. Uh, so, Venerable, I have a question about karma that is kind of, um, I've been thinking about. I was reviewing uh, Steve Jobs because I happen to watch the movie, so I, I wanted to review his case study. And, uh, you know, he had a young wife, uh, but he achieved so much success. And according to Long Pa, who did his case, uh, you know, him dying young is a remnant from his previous existence where he unintentionally um, killed somebody. He beat okay. somebody up. Um, long story in terms of the actual story, but hopefully you can remember it. Um, and my question is, if him getting pancreatic cancer, therefore he passes away, does that pretty much finish that bad remnant? Like, is it done now? Or is does he continue to have that remnant follow him? Like, I feel like at some point, and I know that the Buddha said, don't try to figure out karma because you're going to go crazy. But, but still, I'm just trying to have some sort of logic in terms of, does that karma go away ever? Like, yeah, yeah, it does. It does. There is a way, there is a point when that karma becomes exhausted. I should have added that to the presentation. So at a certain point, the karma be, does become exhausted and it no longer is, has its effect. So, yeah, because let's say you kill somebody like in a previous life accidentally, unintentionally, just because of things like that can happen sometimes and then something like that happens to you. Doesn't that mean it's done because you've already paid that debt? Okay, there are two things here. Okay. I'm getting a bit, you're asking many questions, so my school teacher spirit comes up. There's uh, intentional karma, intentional karma, and there is unintentional karma. Please note that this word actually in the discourses, in the suttas, karma is never unintentional. But in later Buddhist texts and in the Abhidharma, it is sometimes called karma as well. If we do something unintentional. So I'm just going to say unintentional deeds. Okay. Now the Buddha himself in the early text did only use the word karma for the first one. And then the unintentional deeds, he's, he wouldn't use the word karma because the Buddha said, karma is intention. That is actually what the Buddha said, which is a very revolutionary statement considered that in those days, karma was still considered, was still meant doing doing uh doing ceremonies in the right way <laughs> that was the old meaning before buddhism so buddhism made karma something about mo a moral life a moral responsibility rather than just ceremonies so um karma is when we do something intentionally and it will come back to us to a certain extent and at a certain point it will become exhausted and it will just be gone the karma Okay, of course, there will always be a point when it becomes exhausted because karma is similar to an energy which at a certain point becomes exhausted. Our unintentional deeds also, they also become, they, the effect that they have will at a certain point become exhausted. But there's a difference. Unintentional, intentional deeds tend to 
um, tend to ripen more quickly than unintentional deeds. Unintentional deeds, according to the Buddhist Abhidhamma, is uh, ripen will ripen afterwards. After their, all the other karma have ripened or when the, all the other karma no longer have an opportunity to ripen. In other words, unintentional deeds tend to ripen not very often. So if, for example, you accidentally hit uh, an animal when you're driving a car, okay, then that will unintentionally cause harm to the animal and the animal may be killed, but you did not intend to do so then that karma is unlikely to ripen, but it could ripen, but it, you know, that's only ripening when there is no other strong karma. There is no regularly good, there's no regular good deeds that you do. There is no regular bad deeds that you do. So then the unintentional deeds tend to ripen. There are four kinds of karma. There is the karma which is known as the dying, um, what is the word in English? Karma near death, you could say in modern terms, near death karma. Okay, four types of karma. According to the the Visuddhimagga or the later texts. The first one is uh, near death karma. The last thing that we do when we are close to death is what ripens the first. You can follow? Can you follow? Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, so this is sometimes compared, our, our deputy abbot Lomphada Tachivo, he will compare this with the first car that is waiting for the, for the traffic light to go to switch to green. So as soon as the traffic light switches to green, this will be the first car driving. So it will also be the first car to arrive, right? But then after that car, many other car, cars follow. Yeah. Near death karma will be the first to affect your life, your next life. I'm talking about the next life right, right now, okay? But uh, the thing that will immediately have an effect afterwards is what you do habit, habit, habitually. <laughs> My English is uh, not so good today. Habitual karma. That is most important. Um, I'm sorry, I, I skipped one. Heavy karma. Heavy karma will first have its effect. Heavy karma is when we are really doing something very bad, like, like killing your parents or something like that. It's a very bad karma, which usually most people just not do. Okay, that's, that's something that is very heavy. The positive side, the heavy karma, heavy good karma could be uh, that you are meditating and you attain a very deep inner experience. Habitual karma is what you do regularly even if it's a small karma, if you do it regularly, it becomes a habitual karma. Then the last one is unintentional karma. Unintentional karma, or in Thai language, they will sometimes say saktawatam, just doing it. <laughs> so not really into it, okay? Sorry, may I ask a question real quick? Okay, I'm, I'm getting, just, just a moment. Um, I'm getting a bit technical here, but the basic gist is that what will most affect our lives from the 
perspective of the law of karma is what we do regularly, our habits. That is what most affects our lives. So unintentional accidents or something like that, they tend to have attract less karma because they simply are not habitual. They are not motivated by emotion or intent. So they have far less effect. Then the question you asked me is whether uh, these uh, karma will some at some point be exhausted. Well, the 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 long the short answer is that heavy karma will be it takes the longest to uh, get exhausted. I'm so yeah, that that is the longest, and then habitual karma will take also very long to become exhausted because they are so strong. It's what you have been doing regularly. If you have been generous all through your life, that will take a long time for no longer to have an effect on your life. I'm talking both mentally and, and in terms of what happens in your surroundings. Karma is always both at the same time, in, internally and externally. And then what will then uh, have an effect is your near-death karma may also be exhausted quite quickly because that's usually just a few karma, few things you've done. And then your unintentional karma, that will easily become exhausted because there is no motivation or intent behind it. It's just something you did. Sometimes our abbot and teacher in Thailand, Lompa Tamachayo, he will say it's actually indirect karma because it doesn't really, it doesn't feel or, or, or is motivated like karma. So it's just indirect karma. That's the word he uses sometimes, indirect karma. Kam doi om. But uh, if, I don't know exactly what he means by that, but, but it, it, the point he's trying to make is that it, the word karma doesn't really apply. It's just unintentional deeds, but they do have an effect, but very little and only if other deeds are not being done. Okay, is that answering your question? Yeah. But there are no, no formulas, no mathematics. Uh, that's not, it's not possible to calculate exactly what karma will happen when, uh, as you would do in, a, in a, some other calculation, because the Buddha said that karma is uh, an ajintaya, that means, uh, ajintaya means um, it's, un, it's, it's impossible to completely understand it intellect, intellectually, it's too complex for that. You need to intuitively understand it through meditation and through the inside of meditation, clearly see it. Like somebody comparing, you could compare it with somebody having a microscope and somebody trying to look with his naked eyes to see uh, at some body cells or something, that's impossible. Okay, now there was somebody at the back who wanted to ask a question. Actually, she's online, P. it's never oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you're fine. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to ask the question of, so the order of these types of karmas, of the four karmas, that's in the order of the most impact it will have into your next life. Is that correct? Sorry, I think I, I heard you say that. No, the ones that have the first impact. The first impact, okay. So, so near-death karma will usually have the first impact. Mm -hmm. After that, heavy karma, habitual karma, and an unintentional karma. Got you. Okay, so even if you, let's say, um, have done good all, you know, all your life, you've meditated, uh, been good, and then and something that happens right before, kind of near your death, then that's going to affect what happens in the next life. Yes. The same. Okay. Yes, but to a lesser degree, but it will affect immediately. It's like I was, uh, I didn't finish the metaphor, the metaphor of the cars. The first car will go in, suppose you have one red car and you have many green cars following afterwards. When, the, um, when they all stop in front of a light of traffic sign, a traffic light, and you have the first car being green, standing at the front. Mm -hmm. when, the traf when the traffic light goes to green, it switches to green, then the first car will start to drive. It will be the first car to arrive 
at the other side of the traffic square. Mm. But the other cars will quickly follow and eventually the whole traffic square would look red. Mm -hmm. I will look green, whatever you color you want to choose. So in other words, some people have done a lot of habitual karma. I'm going to skip because I'm going to skip heavy karma because that's very exceptional. Hardly ever anyone does that. But uh, habitual karma is what will be most effective in your life. It is just that near death karma will be the first to affect, but mm. it will not affect you much. There's an example of somebody in the time of the Buddha who, uh, who uh, lied uh, and cheated on her husband, but only in one single instance. And apart from that, she never, she led a very responsible and very kind and very beautiful life. Okay. Now I'm not talking into, I'm not taking into consideration that, that he may have also made mistakes, but I'm just talking about her first because she died first at that time. Mm. And he was wondering how she, after her death, how she, when did she attract a good karma, went to a good destination or a bad destination. And then uh, uh, the Buddha, he did not answer that question for the first week. And only after a week did he answer the question when the king asked him. Eventually the king, I mean, we're talking about the queen who was cheating on the king, okay? Eventually the, the king, uh, he, he, he was told by the Buddha that uh, the, the queen had gone to a good destination. He didn't know that during those seven days that the Buddha didn't speak about it. Actually, the queen had gone to a bad destination because she was regretting as her last near-death karma. She was regretting that only one single instance that she cheated on her husband, on her husband, the king. So because of that regret and that moral... Um, conflict she then attracted the bad destination after her death but because she had done a lot of good even just going to a bad destination for a short time she went to a good destination afterwards can you follow yeah yeah understood but i was just not uh i i i'm actually a little bit ahead of myself because i didn't intend to talk very detailed in very detailed much detail about the next life. I simply wanted to say that what affects our life the most is our habits. Mm -hmm. So karma is what we attract in our lives, both mentally and outside of us. If we often speak good of others, we defend others when, they, when we think they are not getting a chance or when they are discredited. We praise others, we speak good of those who are doing good, then we also will find similar experiences in our life. People will praise us, give us credit where credit is due, and will defend us where, where, whenever that is due. That is a habitual karma that will not quickly go away. And the same way if we gossip, then <clears throat> If we often gossip about others, then that will also come back to us. But as with all things in life, things can change. And after a while, new habits set in. And when new habits set in, then we will attract new circumstances. In other words, the things that happen in our lives are very often an echo of what we have done in the past which is very often what our habit will say. You won't say it exactly in those words, but that's basically what it boils down to. So many things that we have experienced, that we are experiencing right now in our lives, whether good or bad, are, are more or less an echo of what we've done in the past. But we will still be affected also by what we do now. Because as I said before, karma is never deterministic or it's never just about uh, something we cannot change. It's always something we can change in the here and now. Okay, uh, let's go back.
Oh, that's the wrong one. <laughs> Okay. So as I mentioned, blame it on your past karma. See, don't see karma as something deterministic. Don't blame it on your past. Don't blame it on God's will and don't blame it on destiny. I've already talked about this in detail. The law of karma or karma, if you want to spell it with double M, you can also do that. Is never, it's never about blaming things or becoming, uh, you know, relieving yourself of responsibility or, or saying that you're not responsible. That's never the thing that karma is about. Karma is always about taking responsibility. So this is not the right, <laughs> not the right intention. <laughs> I believe in karma. That means I can do bad things to people all day long and I assume they deserve it. <laughs> So that is not what karma is, okay? What's this guy, what's this little dog called again? What do you call this? Huh? Dilbert. Dilbert, okay. <laughs> there is some sort of, there is a certain amount of scientific evidence for the relation between our mind on the one hand and the environment that responds to us on the other hand. As, uh, as um, Simon and I and all the others have listened, discussed previously, there was an experiment done in quantum science, quantum physics that has shown that just the act of observing reality already affects reality. So reality is constant, continually affected by our mind according to Buddhism. And this is partly uh, had to partly found there is some, some certain amount of evidence in science that suggests that this is also uh, to some extent true in, in what has been proven by science. So there's a Buddhist proverb that is actually the first proverb of the Dhammapada or the book of Buddhist proverbs that says that the mind is precedes everything. When we do something with a well-directed mind, we will attract happiness, just like our shadow that never follows us, uh, that always follows us, <laughs> or that never leaves us. So the same way we could say that whenever we do something good, it must follow us. Of course, at a certain point, the karma will become exhausted and it will leave us. But, you know, that's just... Uh, that's getting into the details. But the general gist is that we can never re flee from a karma, but the karma at a certain point will become exhausted. There's also another thing that we can compare it with. Karma in science, does it exist? There is a new branch in genetics, which has been existing for about 20 years or something, called epigenetics. And epigenetics actually says that genes are not just the whole story. It's not just the whole story or you're like your genes are. I mean, whenever something wrong in your life, you say, I inherited that from my father. <laughs> this is the genes from my father or my mother. And uh, that's nothing I can do about that or something like that. It's never, it's never that simple. Modern science, especially the branch of epigenetics, says that genes can be switched on and off by certain behaviors. When we smoke regularly, when we drink regularly, certain diets and stress even can switch on or switch off certain genes. This has been proven for quite a while now. So they have actually discovered that in the Second World War, in notably in Holland, certain things uh, happened more easily because genes were switched on and certain, uh, uh, causing certain conditions, certain illnesses to happen more easily. We know, for example, that the, the cold, um, the very, very cold winter when there was a lot of hunger in Holland because we were, uh, we were occupied by Nazi Germany in, during the Second World War, Many 
uh, people, many children that bo were born in those days were born with schizophrenia, schizophrenia. And that's, that's, that's a bit complex how that is related. And epigenetics says that behavior can switch off and switch on certain genes. So this is very similar to the concept of karma in Buddhism, which says that we have certain bagage, baggage, baggage, certain luggage from the past, certain things we need to carry with us. But at a certain point, our actions in the present can change whether we still need to continue to carry that luggage with us or we can leave it behind. Can you follow what I mean? Yeah. Um, so what I mean is that certain bad things that we've done in our lives, uh, sometimes we can change them in the present. Certain bad things that happen in our lives in terms of illnesses, bad health, or uh, maybe people around us that hurt us or something like that. All those things can change. Many of those things can change because even the physical reality which underlies them can change very often, including our genes. So this is uh, me trying to look very scientific. <laughs> But actually, the, what I'm telling you here is uh, you can confirm it with anyone who's working in the field. I'm very careful with not citing any fringe theories. This is mainstream science. Oh, I just lost you guys. Okay. So these are some examples that I mentioned before. The working of the law of karma. When we, these are some examples, but again, I have to say it's always very complex. Karmas can always interact. One karma can cut short another karma. Uh, some karmas can support another karma. Some karmas can basically cancel another karma. It's, it's pretty complex. But in basic, the basic rules are that certain karmas cause certain effects. There's a pattern in life. I mean, we can see birds flying in the sky and even birds have certain patterns, right? Even though we say that when we like to think of something natural, we tend to think of something that hasn't got any pattern in it, doesn't have any system to it, then we say that's natural. But in fact, the very nature of reality of nature around us is that it has a pattern, that it has a system to it. Killing living beings causes short life, according to Buddhism. Giving up doing so gives us a long life. This also has a positive side to it, that we are compassionate to human beings, to animals around us. Similarly, injuring, injuring beings, what do you call that? Injuring? Injuring, right? Injuring beings, injuring living beings, injuring animals or injuring hurting people causes sickness. Not doing so causes health. In other words, if we always make sure we don't hurt animals, we don't hurt human beings, we even try not to hurt little animals like mosquitoes and such. This leads to a good health. Okay, there are also other causes for good health, but I'm just giving you this particular cause. Being angry leads to ugliness and not being angry leads to beauty. I think this is easily to, to see. <laughs> Envious, envy leads to having no influence. If you are somebody who often tries to make a proposal to your boss and he never listens, you might want to check upon, <laughs> you might want to check whether you still have the habit of being envious to other people. Or if you are somebody who's never envious or on the, and, and on the positive side tends to be encouraging, 
tends to be happy with other people's happiness, then you will tend to be somebody who has influence. Then there is not giving to clergy. That is what the text says, but it could mean any religion that is, that is encouraging to us to have to lead wise and to lead good lives. Not giving to clergy or not giving in general leads to poverty. If we never give, it's impossible that we will be given. Giving, on the other hand, leads to wealth. If we give, we tend to be given by others. So we will have opportunities to be wealthy. But it always is a matter of intention. For example, for a millionaire, a little gift, a gift of $5 may not be very valuable. And when he gives that gift, he may not think much about it. Then the karma will not be that strong. But if somebody is very poor and with the most efforts and the, with greatest sacrifice gives $5, which is very difficult to, to give for somebody who's very poor and cannot really miss the money, then that gift will be very strong, karmically speaking. So we have several stories in Buddhism about kind of this kind of people that were very poor and then still gave something and then that led immediately to good results in their life. This shows the, that karma is very much connected with intention and with the mind. Being arrogant can lead us to be born in a class family or a low class family or family of little opportunities. Being respectful on the other hand can us, cause us to be born in a high class family. That doesn't mean that every person that's born in a low class family is justifyingly so be born in that family. It may not be justified at all. It, in fact, the whole karma is not about something being justified. It is about um, whether something happens or not, whether there's a pattern in the, in the way the world works or not. When we see somebody who's born in a poor family or born in a family with little opportunity and little privilege, then that is just a sad thing. And we, we should wish the best for somebody like that. On the other hand, people might be born in a good family with much privilege, but not being aware of their good karma causing that. And therefore, as many in many cases, using that privilege for doing a lot of wrong things. Some people are born with a lot of beauty, but do not use that beauty for a good purpose. Some people are born very handsome and don't use it for a good purpose. This is always depending on us in the here and now. There is no justice in karma itself. Karma doesn't have a lesson behind it. Karma doesn't have a plan behind it. Karma is just like the law of gravity the law of energy or any other physical law in physics. When somebody jumps up, jumps off a building, there is no justice behind it. There is just somebody jumping off a building and dying. It's simply the law of gravity. You won't blame Newton for it because he just discovered the law. In the same way, the Buddha simply discovered the law of karma. We cannot blame him for it for causing this or discovering this pattern. But he will simply say, this is how it works, but we want everyone to be happy and have opportunities to grow. Even among some Asian people, including Thai people, this is sometimes misunderstood. It's sometimes seen that poor people deserve to be poor and they should not be taken care of. This is actually not what the karma, law of karma says. Being arrogant 
can cause you to be born in a family with little opportunities. Being respectful, on the other hand, because you always look for the good in others, can cause you to be born in a family with much opportunity. Seeing clergy and asking white questions and not seeing so also affect your wisdom. This, in modern terms, you could also say that somebody tries to do an effort to read up on good teachings, for example, good wisdom from Buddhism uh, and other people who might not be in the habit of reading. But it could also be like a teaching that I'm giving you now, giving you a Dharma talk. Listening to a Dharma talk like this will lead, by the law of karma, will inevitably, inevitably lead to wisdom. But not, uh, not doing so will lead to lack of wisdom. These are all examples that are mentioned in the texts. But karma can only truly and fully be understood by direct experience through meditation, through the eye or the vision of the Dhammakaya or the vision inside, which comes as a result of meditation. So uh, this is um, an important thing because it's important for us to realize that we can't be quick to judge another person for their actions or to judge that every single circumstance is caused by the same action. For example, there was one person who wrote a letter to our abbot and teacher in Thailand asking whether, why he was born on an island which caused him to have little opportunities economically and have little opportunities uh, socially to interact with other people when in many limitations from being born on that island and our abbot and teacher in Thailand said well in a previous life you had the intention to, you wanted to find solitude you always simply wanted to be to find more solitude in life it was not a bad karma you simply had that intention and it you carry that intention with you in the next life and it affected your life as it is now. So we cannot always say that everything is karma or that we judge somebody too quickly on their deeds. So therefore the Buddha said we should not, oh, we should not be somebody to be quick to judge others and that things may be complex, the differences between people may be complex. Sometimes we see people who appear to be not very good people to us, but they might have a lot of goodness that we don't see or the other way around. <laughs> Some people, you know, they might have a bad side to them that they don't show. But it's sometimes, some people have said that it's more justified to be a bit more confident in the goodness of people and sometimes be mistaken then always be suspicious of others and sometimes be mistaken. The first would be more prefer preferable because we would still lead more happy lives and <laughs> encourage others. <laughs> but this is not something supported by Buddhism, but anyway, it's, a, it's an inter interesting thought. Are you still with me or am I talking abracadabra? Oh, no. Okay, um, we're still with you. Does anyone have any questions? Because Lumpy, um, he, I know he's had a long day too. He teaches another class as well. Okay. No questions, Lumpy. No more questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so uh, today we covered the full presentation of this PowerPoint. I think we ran out of sheets already for this PowerPoint. Let me just check. Oh, there's one reflection at the end. So this one I will uh, give to you as a, as a final souvenir. You can reflect on it. And it's part of the evening chanting, which is often chanted in many of our meditation centers or temples. And after that, the presentation will be finished. And we will go to the next presentation, which is about the origin origins of our life as it is now. In other words, previous lives. Mm -hmm. And is it true that some children can remember their previous lives or is that just a hoax? 
I will be talking about that next time. But I'll leave a little bit of a cliffhanger <laughs> so you can have something to think about. Can I ask a quick question? Sorry. Sure. Uh, it goes back to the, the little picture you showed of the like the little dog and saying, you know, if I do bad unto others, it's them receiving their karma. So in the situation that, you know, you're, you're doing bad unto other, like somebody's doing bad unto others. And I mean, obviously they're going to get their karma for that. But what about the other person who's receiving it? Is that counted as bad luck or is that bad karma for them as well? So you refer to this cartoon. Yeah. yeah. So, so there is uh, sometimes this, uh, you could also distinguish between the effects of karma and karma. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when you do something that is hurtful to the other person, what really is happening is that the other person is attracting the bad karma. Mm -hmm. you, may have had, you may have the intention to hurt another person already, but the person that you actually, you start to, you start to vent your feelings to that might affect might be affected by whatever person has the, the bad karma at that time. In the same way, you could also say that suppose you are you have a thief that it tends to uh, you have a burglar that intends to to choose a house to mm -hmm. commit theft on a, on a on a certain night. Then he might in his choice, without being aware of it, he might be affected by the karma of each owner of the house. Mm. So when somebody has never stolen in his life, then when the thief or the burglar goes to look at this house, somehow there will be something that demotivates him. He will not be motivated to, to, to steal something from that house because somehow it is not attractive to him. Mm. But on the other hand, uh, another house may be very attractive to him simply because the person in that house has a karma. Okay, so so in this way you could say that the the thief is affected by the bad karma of the person in the house, but he will also be doing his new bad karma. Mm -hmm. So there is an old bad karma of the person in the house which has its effect, which is ripening, causing the thief, the burglar, to break into the house and steal things. Once he has stolen those things, the bad karma from the owner of the house may be exhausted. But the thief will still have a new bad karma, which causes him to be stolen from in the future. And this is how it continues on and on and on. And this is why the Buddha always wanted people to be peaceful, live peaceful with each other. So this continuous cycle of hurting each other would stop. Is that giving you an answer? Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Because I cannot see you, so I don't know if you like showing a face like, yeah, I get it, or showing a face like, I no, don't know talking that about. makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. My my confusion was just if the person at the receiving end was just unlucky or if they were receiving, you know, karma as well. But no, that explanation yeah. definitely make, makes uh, a lot of sense. Yeah, thanks for the question. It's a good question. This question was asked before in another opportunity, another occasion by a, and was answered by another teacher. And therefore, I, I, I gave this example and I borrowed it from him. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. So we went through our time, we ran out of time. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. Going to take a big, a bit of a break now. I've been teaching um, Alabama or what, sorry, not Alabama. Um, Chicago. Chicago, just before this. And uh, be talking to uh, this very, uh, this very um, enthusiastic Burmese abbot. <laughs> So uh, that gave me a lot of ideas, but now I, I think I'm going to take a break. <laughs> <laughs>